everyone welcome back to english 116 this is for our class for wednesday the 6th of december where i wanted to start talking about poetry and luckily i am on the mend i'm happy to say and the three poems that i wanted to talk about today would be shall i compare thee to a summer's day the sick rose and because i could not stop for death so basically what I did was I selected a poem from each century, starting with the 1600s, moving to the 1700s, and then moving to the 1800s. Obviously, there was a lot of poetry that was written during those time periods. I just wanted to give you a little bit of a taste. We'll do a few more poems from the 1900s and ultimately end with the um, 2020s. And that said, we will see that if you look at the notes below, we are coming close to the ending of the semester. So paper number two, which is on drama, is going to be due on the 13th, which is Wednesday. And the very ending of the semester is the 18th, which is Monday. And that is for our final examination. So what I will be doing is posting the final exam at... Um, yeah, on the 18th and then you will have 24 hours in which to respond to that final and to return it back to me so i'll post it on the 18th at 10 30 a.m it'll be due on the 19th which is 10 30 a.m if we were taking this in a face-to-face -face format you would have two hours to take the examination which is what i'm pretty much expecting that you should be devoting to the exam even though you have 24 hours to complete it my giving you 24 hours because it's in an online format. I ask that you just send that to me via PDF as you have been doing with your papers. And note that your second paper and your um, revision, if you would like to do a revision, will not be accepted after the 18th. Um, the semester's over at that point. So I just wanted to be very clear at that point and probably take me a little bit of time to get your evaluated work back to you after that but i will get it back to you as i will be busy trying to get in uh, my final grades and in terms of the second paper i'm asking that basically you do what you did with the first paper you just are writing in this instance from our drama section so either you're talking about the film that we viewed dead poet society or you are or I'm sorry, either you are, are talking about A Midsummer Night's Dream or you're talking about um, Oedipus the King or you are talking about Raisin in the Sun or you are talking about performance rather than the play itself. And I had suggested that you could discuss canon or you could discuss contemporary relevance, but you can also create your own essay topic just as long as you have that topic approved by me. The final exam will be mostly devoted to poetry. So what I will be doing is just providing several um, essay question prompts and asking you to choose some. And they will be based either on the poems that we've read or the film that we saw, Dead Poets Society. So you'll have choice within that. And that'll be 80 points of the examination. Um, what's left is 10 points for short story, 10 points for drama. So these will be shorter um, essay questions. And in terms of thinking about um, how to prepare for the final, the best way is basically just to have done all the reading and watched all the videos, read all of the discussion form responses and my responses in turn. I know I'm behind with my discussion form responses to you, planning on catching up in the next several days. At this point, I should have returned paper number one to you. If you did a revision for paper number one, I'm still working on revisions, um, but I'll be getting on that as soon as I can. And of course, in terms of thinking about um, the examination, I don't expect anything as neat or as well written or as polished as what you would do with an academic paper where you would have two weeks. Instead, you'd have approximately two hours. Even though I'm giving you 24 hours, I don't expect you to spend more than two hours or so on the exam. But you still should have a beginning, a middle, and an end, an intro, body, and conclusion. And um, do note that it's an open book, open note examination so that you can use references um, much like you would if you were writing a, a paper you could use books and notes um, the difference again is just the time that you would have 
So in terms of the three poems that I wanted to talk about today, the first is a Shakespearean sonnet. And this was written in the early 1600s. If you remember, we talked a little bit about sonnets at the beginning of the semester where we had talked about A Sorrowful Woman and how she was contemplating writing a sonnet, which is a very strict and stylized form of writing. And she decided that she didn't have to follow all of those rules, which reinforced part of what she was contemplating with her own life about being a wife and a mother. And you'll notice that I've included links with all of these poems, as well as the page numbers for the text that I had ordered for the class. Do know that sometimes these poems are not included in the text I had ordered. They're listed as handout on your outline, but I would have provided a link for them. Most of the links come from the Poetry Foundation, which is a great resource for finding information about poetry and specifically for po finding the poems themselves. So a Shakespearean sonnet has a very strict structure in terms of length. It's 14 lines long in terms of rhyme scheme or the rhyme pattern. The way we determine the rhyme is by looking at the last word of each line. So we identify each new rhyme with the letter of the alphabet, starting with A, working our way down the alphabet. So the pattern for a Shakespearean sonnet would be A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. Shakespearean sonnet would also be written in iambic pentameter, which means a 10 syllable line and would also have to be about lofty themes, themes that are considered to be important enough to write poetry about, not the common or the mundane. So to give you a little bit of an idea, Shakespeare wrote over 100 of these sonnets, and we think he wrote them mostly during times of plague, when the theater houses were closed. And as you know, we have very little information about Shakespeare, but scholars have divided these sonnets up into two major groups the early group of sonnets, and the latter, the later group of sonnets. And the later ones are thought to have been written to a specific person known as the Dark Lady, someone with dark hair and dark eyes, someone that Shakespeare was at the very least infatuated with, at the very most um, had an illicit affair with. Not necessarily dark skin. Um, think instead Hermia, if you will, in A Midsummer Night's Dream. And... The early set of sonnets are thought to have been written to a young man, possibly Shakespeare's patron, such as the Earl of Southampton, someone Shakespeare wanted to flatter, someone Shakespeare wanted to honor. None of these sonnets were numbered, or none of these sonnets were titled, I should say, so they are referred to by their first line or by the number that scholars have given them. So, shall I compare thee to a summer's day as perhaps Shakespeare's most famous sonnet? It is also Shakespeare's most misunderstood sonnet because it's oftentimes read as a love poem and one of romance. And there is nothing in that poem to indicate that it is about a romance or an intimate relationship. Usually it's read as a poem that is showing a woman love. There are no pronouns in that poem that would indicate any gender. Um, there are these and thous, which means you. And again, if scholars are correct and we have no reason to believe that they're not, this poem was written to a young man. People who like uh, conspiracy theories would perhaps argue that there is some sort of sexual suggestiveness in the poem that suggests perhaps some um, um, homoerotic elements. Um, but the reality is there isn't. There, there just is a poem that's celebrating somebody's beauty. And I wanted to read that poem to you. Poetry is very musical, so you definitely want to listen to the sound of the poet. And the poem reads, Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometime declines by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest, nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade when eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe, their eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. So if we were to go through this poem and go through it line by line, and try to understand, paraphrase what's happening, and explicate what's happening, giving a detailed analysis. 
we have the beginning that starts with the question, should I compare thee or you to a summer's day? The summer being symbolic of perhaps the height of life, the, the height of perfection. Um, daytime being considered the height of perfection if we went through the stages of time with um, morning, let's say, representative of childhood and daytime representative of adulthood and evening representative of old age and descent. And the same thing in terms of the seasons, the summer would represent the height or adulthood. Uh, the fall might represent middle age, the beginning of descent, winter descent, spring birth. So the summer's day is supposed to represent perfection. And then the rest of the sonnet goes, talk, goes on and talks about all of the flaws associated with the summer. That this person, thou, meaning you, are more lovely than the summer, more temperate, you're more predictable. Because rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, the darling buds being the young flowers that are to bloom that come out in May. So sometimes it's too windy. In other words, there can be inclement weather in the summer. And summer's lease hath all too short a date. I love the term lease because lease suggests non-ownership. That basically it's something that you have for a moment, but it isn't necessarily something that you own. Sometimes too hot the eye of heaven shines. The eye of heaven being the sun, and sometimes it's too hot. And of course, he could have said the sun, but keep in mind that we need to keep not only to the poetic um, sounds uh, that we expect in poetry, but it also has to keep to a particular rhyme scheme of A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. What that would mean is that the word day should rhyme with May, and temperate should rhyme with date, and shine should rhyme with declines, and dim should rhyme with untrimmed, fade should rhyme with shade, always should rhyme with growest. And then the last two lines are a couplet, meaning they rhyme together, C and thee. And the last two lines serve as a, a kind of almost concluding paragraph summarizing everything. And yes, we do have 14 lines, as is expected in the sonnet. And we do have a 10-syllable line. So just take the first line. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? That's very deliberate with 10 syllables. So too hot the eye of heaven shines. Works in terms of the construction of what we wanted for a sonnet, or at least a Shakespearean sonnet. Usually when we talk about sonnets, we discuss or we assume Shakespearean sonnet, though there are other kinds of sonnets. And often is his gold complexion dim, so sometimes it becomes cloudy, the sun. Notice how the sun is referred to as a male, a very long literary tradition of the sun is male, moon is female. And every fair from fair sometimes declines. Fair in this instance does not mean justice, it means beauty, much like the fairy tale. Uh, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest one of all? And all beauty declines, whether by chance or nature's changing course and trends. So beauty declines either through accident or through aging, which is what nature's changing course and trimmed is. But thy eternal summer shall not fade. In other words, this person will have beauty and perfection eternally. Nor lose possession of that fair thou owest. You're given a definition for always, which means possess at the time that that word would have been used in its context in the Renaissance. Nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade. There's a long literary tradition of death being presented as male as well. His. Think of the Grim Reaper. When eternal lines to time thou growest. In other words, this person is going to live eternally, but how is such a thing possible? Well, we have the answer in the last two lines. So long as men can breathe, their eyes can see. So long lives this, this gives life to thee. What makes the last two lines perhaps unclear is the use of the pronoun this. A pronoun is supposed to take the place of a noun. A noun is a person, place, thing, or idea. And the noun should be clearly stated in the actual sentence, if you're writing a sentence, so that it's clear what the pronoun is replacing. So in your first papers, for instance, if you were using a pronoun and it wasn't clear in that specific sentence what noun was being replaced because you didn't mention that noun, I probably would have circled the pronoun and said something like unclear pronoun reference, be concrete. So I might have circled something like this, the word this, and said this what. 
And chances are that you would have given the answer in a previous sentence. You would have listed the noun. But you can't look at previous sentences when you're looking at grammar. You can only look at the actual sentence itself. So I'll provide you with the noun. Keep in mind that Shakespeare didn't have to do that because he wasn't writing sentences. He was writing poetry. But as long as men can breathe, their eyes can see, so long lives this poem. This poem gives life to thee. In other words, this person can achieve immortality through verse, through poetry itself. As long as someone is alive to read the poetry. As long as men can breathe, their eyes can see. And this is quite the statement from Shakespeare. Very subversive in some respects because Shakespeare is just likening himself to a god. Because only god can offer eternity. Oh, and the artist, specifically a good artist, Shakespeare. And we know from Midsummer Night's Dream that Shakespeare very clearly showed us how he was a good artist in contrast to bad writers and bad performers, such as Bottom in Pyramus and Thisbe, for instance. So that particular sonnet, if nothing else, is misread because it's usually thought of as a love poem to a woman, and it's not. Again, according to scholars, it was written to a young man, probably Shakespeare's patron. It's a poem about this person's beauty, which will be everlasting. It's not necessarily erotic. It's more a poem of flattery. Now, another kind of poetry that was quite popular in the 1700s in this instance, because shall I compare thee to summer day, has been dated around 1609. Remember, scholars aren't even sure about specific dates. But... The next poem is by William Blake, who was one of the Romantic poets. They were writing in the 1700s. The poem I selected is called The Sick Rose. It was written in 1794. Now, when you hear romantic, you assume some sort of uh, intimate relationship. That's not what romantics meant in the 1700s. The romantics meant a celebration of nature and the natural world and seeing how humanity was mirrored in the natural world or perhaps the other way around. But regardless, the idea that the natural world served as a vehicle to make commentary on human existence. And one of the important things about the Romantics, and one of the reasons why I like to study the Romantics at this point in the semester, is because you should be reading their poem li poetry literally, as well as symbolically and figuratively. And at this point of the semester, I know we've become suspicious about any literal meanings because we assume that it means something more. But might I suggest that in romantic poetry, it can mean just what it says. It's a celebration of nature, but it can also imply something else. Note that this poem was not included in the textbook. I have it listed as handout, but I have included a link to it. And I will read it to you. And it's quite short. It's only eight lines long. The Sick Rose by William Blake. O oh, Rose, thou art sick. The invisible worm that flies in the night in the howling storm has found out thy bed of crimson joy. In his dark secret love does thy life destroy. Notice how this poem is divided into two sections. Each of those sections are known as stanzas. They almost serve like paragraphs, so they should be talking about different topics in effect. And, of course, the title leads to the question of what is Rose? We've been down this road before when we were talking about a rose for Emily and all of the possible images that could be associated with Rose. And, of course, why is this Rose sick? And we're told at the beginning, oh, Rose, thou, you art sick. Whether Rose be a literal person who is sick, and then we have to wonder why she's sick. Or whether Rose could be a literal flower that's sick. And then we would have to wonder why this flower would be sick. Or could Rose be a symbol for something like society? The invisible worm. And again, we have to wonder what the invisible worm is. And it could just as simply be an insect that's attacking a flower in its flower bed. A parasite. Um, when you think about the food chain, one life form lives off of another. Um, or the worm could be perhaps an image. Worms are oftentimes used as images for death. Worms are oftentimes used as images for sickness. Worms are oftentimes used as phallic images. So this could be about the loss of virginity or it could be about an illicit affair. The invisible worm that flies in the night in the howling storm. 
and that's the setting which obviously something negative nighttime howling storms has found out thy bed of crimson joy and this could just be a rose bed of red flowers, but it could also be the bed where someone takes two when they're sick or the bed when someone wants to be intimate with someone else. Crimson could be representational blood, which could also represent sickness or could also represent loss of virginity. And his, notice that the worm is referred to as a he, his dark secret love does thy life destroy. And is the life literally destroyed through death or is it a reputation that's destroyed through loss of virginity or through illicit affair? And is secret love literal or is it figurative? Uh, one of the nice things about the romantics is that it could mean any of a number of things. So an eight line poem could result in an eight page paper. Um, but that said, do remember that you should read the romantics literally. This could just be about a flower that is being attacked by an insect or some sort of a parasite. But it can also mean so much more. And then the last poem that I wanted to end with today would be from the 1800s. And this poem is from Emily Dickinson, a name I suspect that you recognize. Emily Dickinson being local from Amherst. And Emily Dickinson's poetry is not necessarily the easiest thing to read. In fact, even scholars who have devoted themselves to Emily Dickinson say they don't necessarily understand her, which made me feel a lot better when I was first studying Emily Dickinson because I didn't necessarily understand her. Um, the way that I suggest approaching Emily Dickinson is rather than trying to understand a poem in its entirety, is just to understand a word or perhaps a few lines. And oftentimes they're filled with so much meaning. One of my favorite lines from Emily Dickinson, it's something that I talk about in my Gothic literature class, is one need not be a chamber to be haunted. One need not be a chamber to be haunted. Um, or at GCC graduations, another line that oftentimes has been quoted is, I dwell in possibility. Think about how well that applies to students and all of the possible associations with dwell whether it is living in as an habitation or obsessing over to dwell over. But in this particular instance, the poem that I, I selected because I could not stop for death is a poem that I think is fairly understandable, at least for Dickinson. And um, you should know a few things about Dickinson. She wrote over a thousand poems and she wrote them privately for herself. They were published after her death by her sister, and they were put together in volumes and edited, unfortunately. And they were edited for grammatical errors, as if a grammatical error could exist in a piece of poetry, because you can break all the rules in poetry. Specifically, irregular capitalization and the use of dashes at the ending of lines, rather than commas, which would be the standard punctuation. And it really wasn't until the 1960s that her poetry was published in the way that she wrote it. That's when it became really interesting. It was much more raw and much more defiant. And Emily Dickinson broke all kinds of conventions with the way she lived her life. So it would make sense that she would break conventions in her poetry as well. Just the fact that she was a female writing during this time period. Um, she went to college, which also defied conventions, Mount Holyoke, a woman's college that was meant to basically prepare women for um, wifehood and motherhood and to be spiritual leaders in their community. Um, Emily Dickinson was very clear that she didn't believe in organized religion, which would have been scandalous at the time, especially somebody from her family, rather affluent family. Her father was an attorney in Amherst, and she even refused to go to church. And she never married, nor had children, and openly stated that she hated housework. She went against all of the conventions of the time. Basically, she spent most of her time locked away in a room, and she had the privilege um, and comfort to be able to do that because of her wealthy family, and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote. Um, many would call her agoraphobic in today's language, afraid to go outside. Um, that said, she was able to, by devoting herself completely to her writing, express emotional states in a way that perhaps no other poet has been able to do. No easy trick to be able to articulate in language what an emotion is. Perhaps that's one of the reasons why Emily Dickinson's poetry is so challenging. 
Also, Emily Dickinson tended to write about some other dark topics, oftentimes about death, but presenting death not as a negative, but as a positive, because there would be an afterlife, not because it was something that was preached in a church, but because the presence of God could be seen everywhere in the natural world. And we definitely get this idea of afterlife in Because I Could Not Stop for Death, which was a poem that I wanted to read to you. When you are reading Emily Dickinson, you want to make sure you're reading her original poetry, not the poetry that would have been edited. The quick way to tell is look for dashes. If you see dashes at the ending of the line, that's what Emily Dickinson wrote. A dash is a long pause, by the way, as opposed to a comma, which is a shorter pause. It lends a certain level of drama to something. It's kind of like the long pause you take before a punchline and a joke. It also can mimic the long pauses that you take when you are singing a church hymnal. That's another way that her writing could be seen as subversive. And the sense that she's using something that could be associated with organized religion, some of the patterns of church songs, but mimicking that in her poetry. And the reason why there are long poems or long pauses at the ending of songs or at, at the ending of lines of songs is because you need time to be able to take a breath so that you could sing the next line. None of Emily Dickinson's poetry was titled. Again, she wrote for herself. In some ways, it's similar to Shakespeare's poetry. And scholars have done the same thing. They either refer to her poetry by the first line, in this instance, because I could not stop her death, or by its number, because scholars have tried to put this in some sort of a numerical order. So the poem, Because I Could Not Stop for Death, written in 1863, reads, Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. The carriage held but just ourselves, an immortality. We slowly drove, he knew no haste, and I had put away my labor and my leisure too for his civility. We passed the school where children strove at recess in the ring. We passed the fields of gazing grain. We passed the setting sun. Or rather, he passed us. The dews drew quivering and chill. For only gossamer my gown, my tippet only tool. We paused before a house that seemed a swelling of the ground. The roof was scarcely visible, the cornice in the ground. Since then tis centuries and yet feel shorter than the day. I first surmise the horses' heads were toward eternity. And if we were to go through this poem stanza by stanza or section by section, note that the first line, because I could not stop for her for death. Death is capitalized, it's personified, it's given human qualities. Um, again, very common to think of death as the Grim Reaper. And that said, much of her poetry is very personal. She uses the I, this is her experience, but her experience parallels the experience of many people, which is what universalizes the poem and why so many people, I think, embrace her poetry. That because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. Notice how she refers to death as kind. It's usually not something we think of in terms of death. The idea is that death has the power, not the human. Death decides when it's our time to transition over into the afterlife. We don't make that decision. Death does. The carriage held but just ourselves in immortality. There's a long literary tradition of taking a carriage ride to represent the ride of life. Obviously, they wouldn't have had automobiles during this time period, so this would be a horse-drawn carriage that held her death and immortality. The idea, this is what death brings, immortality. That's why death is kind. And we slowly dro drove, he knew no haste. There's no need to rush in the afterlife because there is no time. It's eternal. And I had put away my labor and my leisure, too, for his civility. So death has been called both civil and kind. These are all positives. And you don't need labor nor leisure in the afterlife. These are human constructs. The only reason why we need leisure in the human world is because we labor. But neither of these exists in the afterlife. Um, a dimension that perhaps none of us can conceptualize. We pass the school where children strove at recess in the ring. This is supposed to represent the early stage of life, childhood, children, and school learning. Playing, which is what you do at recess in the ring. If you've ever heard Ring Around the Rosie, um, Pocket Full of Posy, that was actually a song about plague. And rather appropriate since this poem is about death. 
We pass the fields of gazing green. Gazing green, this would be representational of adulthood and work, specifically farming and growing crops. For us now, it's probably office work. Same difference. And we pass the setting sun, and that's the representation for old age, the ending of life. Or rather, he passed us. Notice that they're transitioning away from the human realm and they're going into another realm, a spiritual realm. So much so that we see a change in temperature. The dews drew quivering and chill. And this idea here that my gong was only of gossamer. Gossamer is something that's very thin, um, very insubstantial. My tippet, which means a shawl, only tool. Tool is also another thin fabric. It's used for things like tutus, wedding bales. The idea is that even though it's cold, she's wearing something that's not very substantial, in part because clothing is another human construct. You don't need clothing in the afterlife. We wear clothing in the human world either for protection against the elements or because of social convention. Neither are important. And we pause before a house that seemed, house is capitalized, a swelling of the ground. And of course, lots of conjecture about what this house could be. Perhaps it's a crypt. That's her new house or her grave. Perhaps it's the house of God and it's a church. Perhaps it's her literal home. You know, there's a tradition of bringing a corpse by their home um, before a funeral. But regardless, we pause before a house that seemed a swelling of the ground. The roof was scarcely visible the cornice which is an architectural element on the roof in the ground in other words this house was so far away they've moved so far from the human realm that it just looks like a little dot in the distance and perhaps the last stanza is the most important since then tis centuries and yet feel shorter than the day so she is speaking from the perspective of the dead from the afterlife this poem serves as proof that afterlife exists because she's speaking from the afterlife. And this means that the events that were detailed in the poem previously had happened in the past. It happened centuries ago, yet it feels shorter than the day. Again, time is another human construct, something that does not exist in the afterworld. I first surmise the horse's heads were towards eternity. Of course, that's literal because the horses are pulling the carriage. This is also a biblical reference and so interesting that Emily Dickinson could reference the Bible even though she openly declared she wasn't religious, at least in terms of organized religion. But she did declare that she was quite spiritual. And the horse's heads is a biblical reference to the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Um, and they're supposed to come before Armageddon, the ending of the world. That is the ultimate death, the ending of all life. Um, when she first surmised the horses' heads ultimately were towards eternity, that this is what the apocalypse will bring, an eternal life in the afterlife. Emily Dickinson's house is in Amherst, and the Emily Dickinson house has been turned into a museum. You can see in the notes below, I've included a link to that museum. I believe they have resumed tours. They had stopped because of COVID. Um, so I encourage you to look at the website and you can get a little bit of sense of what it looks like. Even more so, perhaps going in person. The Amherst is not that far away. But in terms of these three poems, this gives you a little bit of taste of some of the poetry that um, could be written. This is all very traditional poetry. If you think about Dead Poets Society, they definitely would have talked about the romantic poets, people like William Blake. They didn't necessarily mention a Shakespearean sonnet, but there was mention of Shakespeare. Um, one of the critiques about Dead Poets Society, it's a very male-centric film, and the fact that um, Emily Dickinson, or no female poet is referenced, I think is somewhat important in that way. Um, there are other critiques of the film as well in that it, it tends to be very classist. Obviously, we have a very privileged group of individuals that are highlighted in the film. And also that it, it has a certain level of cultural appropriation um, associated with it when you see some of the students taking on um, ethnic names or um, painting ethnic symbols on themselves as an act of defiance. 
Um, certainly there are parts of the film that have not aged particularly well um, when we think about the treatment of female, especially during the party. Um, nevertheless, it still is a wonderful film on many levels, and it definitely has us consider the idea of what poetry is and how poetry can move emotion and inspire. And with these three poems, our attendance question for today is about which one you felt the most connection with. So the attendance question, which would be due on Friday the 8th, and of course, if you need an extension, please let me know. I'd be happy to grant it to you. As you know, I've fallen behind with answering some of the um, attendance question responses, but I will be catching up in the next um, several days. But the attendance question is, which of the three poems that I discussed today, shall I compare thee to a summer's day, the sick rose, or because I could not stop for death, did you like the most, and more importantly, why? So I hope you're doing well. I'm doing well. And we will continue on with poetry again next class. And I wanted to once again remind you of due dates because we are coming close to the end. That the 13th on Wednesday is when paper number two on drama is due. And the 18th on Monday is the very last time that you can hand in any assignments. And it also is the date of our final examination. Again, I hope you're doing well. I'm doing better, and we will continue on next class. Take care. Bye-bye.